Welcome to the Recovery 2.0 Conference. I'm your host, Tommy Rosen, and today I'm so excited to be speaking with Sukhdev Jackson. Sukhdev is an internationally renowned yoga teacher and musician with an extraordinary tale of recovery all her own. She teaches and performs across the world, and along with her husband, Akka, forms the musical duo known as Ikana. Sukhdev, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom, your hope, your experience, your spirit with the Recovery 2.0 community today. Tommy, such a pleasure to be here always, always a pleasure. Well, thank you. Uh, Sukhdev, you asked me before we began, well, what are we gonna talk about today? And really the theme uh, for all of us is a theme of transformation and a, a theme of transformation from the dark into the light, Break, breaking old chains, uh, becoming free, uh, breaking cycles within our family. Mm. And, and I, I thought that would be a good place to start because I know you have an extraordinary family story. And if you were willing to share a little bit of it, it could lead into a, a really powerful conversation. Absolutely. Um, what I'm inspired to lead off with, and you and I often talk about this, is that no matter how much transformation you have under your belt, <laughs> you're still conquering yourself every day and you're conquering your negativity and that really the day, our daily practice and our sadhana and showing up for ourselves and being in community and staying engaged with teachers and mentors and transformational work is really the key to staying above water right now, I think, in this world, you know, that we're, that we're dealing with and, and our own personal addictions, you know, in this case that we're dealing with. Um, I had the great fortune of being one of those souls <laughs> that signed up for a hefty dose of karma. And a friend of mine um, sent me a beautiful text the other day. She goes, gosh, is your karma heavy? But she said, your light is bright enough to transmute it all. Mm. And that's really what I've been holding on to. So I come from a lineage um, of women that suffered tremendously mentally. There was a lot of addiction in my family, there still is. And uh, my, my grandmother and my mother both chose to take their lives when I was six and seven. Mm. And so that left me, you know, angry, confused. And of course, at the tender age of 13, 14, discovered alcohol, marijuana, and that progressed into a, a really deep uh, addiction that lasted till I was 33 years old, which included, you know, a good 10 years, cocaine, crack, ecstasy, I mean, you name it. Mm. And so at 33, I discovered Kundalini Yoga, along with many other things. I discovered a community. I met Akka. Um, uh, I met you guys in the teacher training. I mean, there was so much that happened that year to move me forward. Um, and so, yes, I come from this lineage and my brother, uh, bless his dear heart, recently also chose to leave the planet uh, just six months ago. So, you know, I have this karma that I've come in with. I have this deep, heavy family lineage. But the family that I've created today with my husband and my beautiful six-year-old is an absolute testament to what is possible when one surrenders to not only the fact that there is a higher good in this world and that everything has a purpose and each one of us has come with a great destiny to transmute the pain of our lineage, the pain of our addiction into medicine, mm. into not only medicine for ourselves, but for all of those who come into contact with. Mm. There's one quote lately which has been really feeding me so, so much, and it's Yogi Bhajan, he said, the prophecy of the Aquarian age is that we shall lead each other to liberation. And every time I teach, whether it's to three people or 150 or 1,000 people, I'm always liberated a little bit more. Anytime I get on the phone with my coach or you and I or you and I and Kia and Aka have a deep conversation, 
I'm liberated a little bit more. Mm. When I'm present with my daughter, with my six years old, whether she's screaming her head off about something or like deeply in love with me in that moment, I'm liberated a little bit more. Mm. You know, so it's just, yes, I come with this past and I also have sat in meditation long enough and been in prayer enough that my soul understands that I did choose this, mm -hmm. that I was as a soul before entering this physical, I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> Signing up for the job. Like I'll transmute the pain of that lineage yeah. and start a new generation of light beings, you know, yes. you know, so that's my story, you know, this is going to be a little bit out there for people, but you know, what I'm thinking right now as I hear you speak is that I think the soul doesn't know what it's getting itself into in taking on a human form any more than the human really knows what it's like to be without a human form. And I really feel like it's, it's we don't know that we're going to be able to overcome these challenges until we overcome these challenges. True. And, and, you know, knowing what you've come through and your vigilance mm -hmm. in your practice and the, the, the challenges that, that continue to present for all of us. Yeah. And that one day at a time, we have a practice, uh, a focus that can help us get through it. it. Well, it's just a miracle. And, None of us knew we could do it. So just to complete this thought, I love the story. You know, when I was in active addiction, I had this story. The story, <laughs> the story was, imagine you overcome all this. I, I sincerely had that thought. Mm. Like, imagine, Tommy, you actually overcome all this and you get to become you finally. Wow. And, 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 I, and I tried everything, yeah. and I never had the power to do it. And I just kept feeling worse and worse about myself. I just couldn't live up to my destiny until I found these teachings, initially the 12 steps for me, yeah. a for lot me. of teachers along the way, and then, and then ultimately yoga, and then ultimately kundalini yoga. Uh, to help give me the, the practices and the things necessary to actually learn and grow. What, what are your thoughts about that? Exactly. I, you know, I deal with addiction in, in my everyday life. You know, it, they just come in different, uh, uh, in different forms. It's no longer drugs or alcohol. It could be food. It could be negativity. It could be like a compulsive obsession over one thing. And I truly have to say the way that I can transmute that for me is by getting up before the sun rises. Mm -hmm. I'm toast if I get up with the sun. It's really tough for me to conquer that repetitive, negative, you know, compulsions that I deal with still to this day. And I think that my courage, my willpower, uh, and my discipline to grow into my daily practice and of course community mentors teachers going to these events that you and I go to you know year after year showing up has all been a part of really experiencing victory over this karmic debt or this karmic you know load that I choose to take but then at the same breath Tommy it's like I look at my life today and I looked at Akka and Sahaj, my husband and my daughter, and you and Kia and, and the community that we've created. And it's, it's beyond. I mean, it's, 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 it's like heaven when we're together. You know? <laughs> and we're like cre practicing together and creating together. It's like there's no, there's no place I'd rather be. And I spare a fair amount of time going, mm, maybe it's better over there. Ooh, maybe it's better over there. <laughs> So we all have that syndrome. Oh, yeah. maybe I should go live in Costa Rica. Maybe it'll be better there. You know, it's like, <laughs> wow. But the willpower and, 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 and Yogi Bhajan only came to me in a dream once. But one thing that he said, he goes, your discipline will liberate you. <laughs> it will liberate you. Your discipline will give you everything that you want. 
And day after day, whether I feel like it or not, I find myself on my mat before the sun rises because that's, that's the medicine I need. Mm. That's when I can let go of the tears. You know, I might wake up in great anxiety or with like the picture of my brother, you know, exiting the planet or whatever. And it's like, I go sit on my mat, I pray, I chant, I do yoga. And within half an hour, I've busted through it and I'm a different person. Mm. And that's, that's, that's your daily victory. That's my daily victory. Mm. And that's really like you were talking about breaking the self-imposed s- s- strings of slavery, right? Mm. Only we can do that for us. Mm. Only we can do that for us with help, guidance, and support. I could not do or be sitting here with you, you know, without the help of my mentors, my coach, my friends, my community. Mm my family first yeah. and foremost. ditto to that and uh, i just want to i want to expand upon this idea of sadhana uh, mm-hmm. because uh, we emphasize sadhana for those who are watching sadhana s a d h a n a if you're not familiar with that term it just simply means daily spiritual practice and and what what we mean by daily spiritual practice is a practice of of any kind that really puts you in touch with the divine within, that puts you in touch with your true self, uh, that gets beyond this and moves you down into here. Mm -hmm. That daily practice is the cornerstone, in in our opinion, I'll speak for Sukhdev on this one, it's the cornerstone of transformation. It's where it happens. And so we emphasize that so much in Recovery 2.0. So Sukhdev, Let's talk to people about uh, that practice a little bit more deeply, and uh, we'll, we'll go bit by bit. But tell me what it means to you. What are the elements that could be a part of a sadhana practice for somebody? How to begin, that kind of thing. Sure. I think that you begin where you are. If you can get your ass up <laughs> before the sun rises, you'll get there if that is your intention. It took me like 10 years to commit consistently, 10 years of on and off practice to just finally get that suffering is optional, right? Which is one of the sutras. Suffering is optional. And for me, if I get up, I will not suffer as much as if I don't get up. So sadhana in the traditional sense of kundalini yoga is getting up in what we call the amrit vela, which is the early morning the early morning hours before the sun rises, which is really where the nectar of the divine is. Because if you think about the electromagnetic field of the earth, at those times between 3.30 and 6 a.m., it's down in your area at least. People are asleep. And so there's not as many sort of waves to tap your mind into. And also it's when all the angels and the saints come out and join you and the ancestors, you know. So it's just a beautiful time to, whether it's to sit still and meditate or you want to chant something really simple like Satanama or Ramadasa, or you want to do some Kriya Yoga, um, you know, or you even want to go out of, in nature before the sun rises, which is sometimes what I do, which is what I need sometimes. Like, no, I'm not going to meditate this morning. I need to get out into nature and watch the sunrise. Mm-hmm. So it just, it doesn't have to be any particular thing. But the thing is, is to, I think the biggest thing is to be willing to face yourself and your negativity that early in the morning. Because if you do, you won't have to deal with it all day because you would have transmuted it. And you know, so much of what we do during the day is to run away from experiencing our feelings. Mm. So much of what we do. And if we could just stop for a moment and really tend to our humanness, which is as important as our spiritualness, our humanness needs to be tended to. And the best way it can be tended to is to actually feel what we feel. Because when we don't feel what we feel, that's when we get resentful, that's when we suffer, that's when we start to point the finger, because we're not tending to our own humanness. And for me, sadhana allows me to tend to my own humanness. Sometimes I meet sadhana very neutral. 
Mm-hmm. Sometimes I meet it in tremendous anxiety, having just seen my brother, you know, which has happened v- many, many mornings lately. And sometimes I meet it with all my negativity, <laughs> all my stuff. You know, and sometimes I'm absolutely peaceful. It's never the same on any day. But what I'm guaranteed with is if I do it, there will be something that lifts. There will, I will be, it's, it's kind of like you connect with grace, with the grace of the divine, whatever that is for you, whether it's a higher power, God or the universe, you connect with that energy. And through that, there's a grace that really reveals itself and carries you through the day. I love it. I love it. Well, we, we, for those who are interested, we have a lot of sadhana practices on video in the r20.com membership. So if you're not already a member, come in and, and take a part in that. Uh, and, and let's, let's do sadhana together as a growing and growing audience and membership. Yeah. Um, so Sukhdev, for people who have been undisciplined, and I certainly count myself in this category. Mm-hmm. Um, and for people who are not only undisciplined, but also they lean towards shame. Mm, because of not getting up or doing sadhana. I, I just want to address that issue because I, I want to set people up for uh, self-love. Totally. And, and you know, I, I will be the first to say that I have missed sadhana at least one day this week. i'm I'm still alive and it's okay and i'm not a bad person because of that and i just want to discuss that if you don't mind absolutely and and you know i I, i'm not here to preach about sadhana I'm, i'm really sharing with you the journey that i've been on for the last 13 years and like i said before it really took me 10 years of practice to finally get that for me it's no longer an option Yes. The more you have at stake, the more you want to show up and be present for what you're doing. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that it's better to love yourself and not do sadhana <laughs> than do sadhana and still find reasons to beat yourself up and not love yourself. Thank you. I mean, <laughs> truthfully, really. You know, so it's such a paradox because on one hand, as Kundalini teachers, we want to encourage and support um, our, our students and those who come to our retreats and whatnot to do their sadhana. But on the other hand, I will never grill one of my students for not doing their sadhana. I'll be like, okay, what could you do in a three minute meditation? Could you start with just three minutes of satanama or just putting your hands on your heart or doing wahi guru and clearing your karma? Could you just do left nostril breathing for three minutes? Yes. Could you sit down? Is, is writing morning pages your thing? Mm. Like, do you need to empty your mind? Do you need to go for a walk? Do you need a sweat at 5 a.m.? Whatever floats your boat, nurture that mm. and see if something, you know, when they come on retreat with Recovery 2.0 or they come on retreat with me or whoever, it's like hold on to what, what you're drawn into and what nurtures you. And go into that and explore that and see what's there for you. But you know what? The shame, all of that's got to get thrown out the window. And at the end of the day, like no matter what, it's got to be hands on the heart as you put your head down at night and just be like, I did enough today. Mm-hmm. And I'm another day sober. Mm-hmm. Wow. You know, and I'm another day present to my feelings. Okay, I didn't do sadhana. You know what? I'm going to try again tomorrow. Yeah. And, you know, I think that one of the things that I know keeps me on my game, and I know you and I talk about this a lot, it's like I teach and I do 40-day programs to stay on my sadhana. You know, it's <laughs> like I do 40-day programs like to stay on my sadhana or to elevate my sadhana to another level more correctly. Yes. Well, absolutely. And uh, I think the uh – people often mistake they come to sometimes people have said to me and and maybe you've gotten this as well like you know um maybe i'll i'll show up and i'll be stressed about something or (laughs) exhibit some anger or something yeah i don't understand you're 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 a yoga teacher you you still get stressed (laughs) (laughs) and i'm like uh 
let's let's rewind a minute and let's 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 address this you know it's i'm a yoga teacher by necessity Okay, let's start there. <laughs> I teach because I need to teach. I need to do it. I need to pass it on. I need to center myself. I need, I need the, this is one of the things in place in my life that keeps me on my game, like you were just saying. For sure. <laughs> 100%. And I'll be the first one to own up to it. I mean, when I came into Kundalini yoga teacher training, I was a year sober in 12 steps. And I remember month three, I went for a family reunion in Florida with my family. Mm -hmm. And I decided, like they knew I was doing the Kundalini teacher training. And I decided, I was like, I'm going to teach a Kundalini yoga class every morning for 10 days. Come or not. But my whole family came for 10 days. That was my first teaching experience. And it absolutely transformed me. And at that time, my sadhana was seven minutes of Sat Kriya. That was all I could handle for sadhana right? And I taught those 10 days. And I said, I will never stop teaching. And I came back to LA and I I kept teaching. I never stopped month three, because I knew that teaching was going to grow me and was going to keep me sober. Mm -hmm. Teaching kept me sober for many years while I still had the desire to use. Uh, And now you know, if I imagine a life without my practice, uh, Shakti school and everything that I'm involved in, I, I might be in trouble. <laughs> I might be in trouble, you know. Yes, yes. I do it because I have to, just like you, mm-hmm. you know. Thank you so much. Well, uh, I'm thinking now about uh, folks who might have heard what you just said, which was, it helped me for many years while I still had the desire to use And it's such a profound statement that I have to stop there for a minute and underline that uh, if you could expand upon that idea. So, you know, people have this, again, a misunderstanding that, you know, you get sober and then, you know, the first thing they think is, I'm always going to have the desire to use. That's never going away. And then, and then later on, maybe they, they, the desire goes away and now they think I'll never have the desire to use again. Yeah. And I think either one of those statements could be problematic. What's been your experience? I agree. Uh, you know, first of all, uh, you know, it was by total coincidence, I ended up in 12 step. And, you know, after having smoked crack and snorted cocaine for years and years, like it was marijuana that got me into 12 step, like mm-hmm. how ironic. And as a musician, as a songwriter, I was like, I could never put down the marijuana. It's like what feeds my creativity. Mm-hmm. Um, and yet, you know, what you thought fed your what I thought, (laughs) and yet, you know, in our last 13 years as Icona, we've made more albums than I had in a 20 year music career prior to that, which included a record deal with a major label. So it's like, we've been more productive in 13 years, made like eight albums, you know, than we were in 20, than I was in 20. And yes, you know, what happened for me was... The desire was still there because I was still hanging out with certain people that were living like these fabulous Malibu and Hollywood lives. And I would run in these circles of like kind of celebrities and models and stuff and kind of be on the sideline, you know, in my whites and trying to be cute. (laughs) Like, yeah, I'm a yoga teacher, but watching them sip their wines and maybe smoke a joint, be just like, Oh, that looks so fun. I wish I could still do that. So I still had that feeling, you know, but the more I did Kundalini yoga and the more that I experienced the elevation, which, which was continued as long as I did Kundalini every day, I was like, wow. And finally I I did get to a place where I have never a desire to use. I don't want to check out of my life, Mm -hmm. even for the pain. I will sit through the pain most of the time. I will deal with it. I will find a way to resolve it. I will heal it. Mm -hmm. I will go through it because you know what? I I spent enough time out of my head and that was miserable. Mm -hmm. It was extremely painful and I'd rather feel the pain, like the loss of my brother for the last six months. It's been really tough. I've been in some deep grieving moments where I felt like, 
such a darkness overtake me that, you know, I might sit there for a day or two and then it's like I get on the phone or I talk to somebody or I go get a, a healing treatment. I do something to move me through it. I would rather that than any sort of, you know, relapse into anything else. It's just, uh, but you know, every now and then I'm at a fabulous party or I'm in Europe with my family and everybody's drinking rosé at lunch under the sun in South of France. And I'm just like, well, that's just fabulous. You know, <laughs> look at these tanned people <laughs> in their gorgeous gums having a glass of rosé, you know, on the, <laughs> on the boardwalk in Cannes, you know. <laughs> what could be more natural? What could be more fabulous? <laughs> but it's like, no, I'd rather be able to get up at 5 or 6 a.m., do my practice, be present with my daughter, and deal with my shit. I'd rather that. Yes. Yeah. Can, thank you so much. Because uh, I, I know there's probably nobody watching this, uh, at least in recovery who's watching this, that can't relate to what you just said. <laughs> uh, I may be the only one. I mean, I, it's rare to find a person like, I, I literally, Sukhdev, I, you know, heroin, cocaine, and marijuana, all of it, alcohol, you know, red wine in France. Like, I never, <laughs> ha I never have the thought, honest to God. Yeah that I'd like to go back. Yeah, I hear you. I see people do it, and I'm, I'm honest to God, I'm also not in any judgment of them. Yeah. I'm just so glad not to be in that lifestyle. And I'm so glad not to be thinking about it, because that's so painful, the thinking mm -hmm. about it is so painful. And I really don't want to go back there. And um, for me, there never was an in-between, like a little bit of this or a little bit of that. It never that. It's if I enjoy it, you know, let's take it as far as it can go. You know, I mean, that's the point. Uh, now, now I enjoy yoga and I enjoy writing and I enjoy um, my life with, with Kia and the friends and family and the whole thing that we have. And, and uh, I'd rather stay there and, and help other people to develop that as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So I want to ask you if we, if we can turn our attention a little bit towards other areas of addiction uh, where, where people, once they put down drugs and alcohol, or maybe that wasn't their thing, but they, you know, um, have struggled, say, you know, around food or relationships or <laughs> what, what have you. But we, yeah. I know you have a lot of experience and a lot of wisdom around relationship with food. Yes. And yeah. if you could share a little bit from your perspective, that'd be so wonderful. Absolutely. Um, food and I, you know, it's an ongoing uh, sort of like love affair and then, you know, a big fight. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's really one of the, I, if, I, if, if, if I look at where I am today in relationship to food, it's like I've studied so much around food. I've done so many cleanses. I've, I know how to eat. I know how to re write for my type of my nature and my body and, and stuff like that. And I, I really see that when food and I are not in harmony, it's always a product, a, a, a direct relationship to where I'm at mentally. Mm. And, and it's usually that I'm not in self-acceptance over something. I'm self-criticizing about something. I wish I was more this or less that. I didn't do well enough on this. I should have been, you know, better at that. Or, oh, wow, I had a fight with my daughter and I can't believe I said that. Or my husband. And it's always directed to something that I'm judging myself about. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's really rooted in, in some sort of, 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 of self-hatred, I would say at the heart of it, you know, of like some deep negativity, some unresolved. Um, and for me, it's really at this point, it's just about bringing presence to that because it's my most ancient pattern. It started with food for me. I remember at, you know, five or six years old being in the playground at my Belgian boarding school spooning Nutella on a spoon, eating away my sadness, like where's my mom? Where's my mom? You know, my mom was taken to um, uh, um, a mental ward when I was two years old and I saw her on and off 
between two and six when she took her life. And it was just like, I remember eating my sadness away. And that thread of sort of addiction that began so early is still something that's, that's in me and that I deal with from time to time. But it's always connected to where am I not loving myself? Where am I, uh, where am I out of integrity with myself? Yes. Mm. Where am I not taking the time to nourish myself? If I go, 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 I'm pushing hard and, and, and it gets intense. And then I start to take less care of myself. I'm always taking enough care of myself to, to, to stay at a certain level. But now, you know, the quieter you get, the more neutral and meditative mind you start to develop sort of like, the brighter the light gets shed on your issues. Mm. So my teacher would said to me um, recently, she goes, as you grow in the light, so will your awareness of the darkness grow. Mm -hmm. and, and for me, it's exactly that. Like the food thing and my relationship to when I'm not taking care of myself nutritionally, which is nourishment, right? Which is connected to the mother, the feminine. Mm -hmm. It's directly correlated to I'm not taking enough time to rest. I'm not nourishing myself enough. I'm not playing enough. I'm self-criticizing too much. Yes. You know, this is, this is so critical because you're getting to some of the causes and conditions for someone acting out around food. Yeah. And I think uh, one, of the, one of the challenges we have in addressing addiction or any change of behavior comes because someone might, might think simply, oh, well, why don't I just stop? Hmm. You know, uh, um, I'm gonna, you know, today I'm going to really do it. I'm going to try to stop. I'm not going to eat the chocolate cake. I'm not having any sweets. Yeah. I'm going off sugar for 30 days, you know, whatever it is, whatever the thing is. Yeah. And then we wonder, well, why haven't we been able to muster whatever it is that it takes yeah. to shift? And, and I think a part of the reason is because we're not really looking at it realistically in terms of, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why am I doing this in the first place? <laughs> what, what, what's actually leading to this behavior? Wow. And until we can understand that, as you're describing now, that the, this depth of understanding that you've gained from looking... Um, I, I don't, I don't know the person who's able to just, you know, Oh, why don't you just sit and meditate? Like, well, because I've never done that before and I don't know how to do that before. And I don't, I'm not clear on what gets in the way and I don't know about what I'm supposed to do. You have to learn. Absolutely. It, it's so true, Tommy. And you know, one thing that that's circling back around from our earlier conversation about shame like I know that as a teacher, and this has been really raw and vulnerable here, but even as a teacher, um, you know, I get into these cycles with food where I start to experience tremendous shame because I'm like, wow, I can't believe I'm <laughs> sitting here preaching the good word and I'm not able to get a grip on this thing right now, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and I go into these cycles of shame and then I, and then I do my work you know, and I have my ways of working with my coach. I have a coach and I have a nutritionist and I have my practice. But, but, but when I get into that cycle, I'm really just connecting to, to what's at the root of that. It's back to that same thing. I'm not acknowledging my humanness. Yes. I'm not acknowledging my feelings. Mm. You know, I've been in, 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 in a deep transformational six months with grief and I've been through a lot and I've put on a little bit of weight and then I've lost a little bit of weight, you know, and I've been a, through a thing with food in the last six months. And I'm like, damn, like you can't even spend one moment criticizing yourself about this. Look at what you've just been through. Have some compassion for yourself. And I tell you, as soon as I do that, like the need to eat a whole bar of chocolate in one sitting, Mm. It disappears. Mm. I'm like, I can just take four bites and I'll be okay. Mm. Or I can have one cup of tea in the morning and not have to have three cups of tea during the day. Yes. Like as soon as I can just sit with my humanness, my pain, my sadness, and just really give it to myself to feel it, mm. it just like lifts. 
it just lifts like a veil and then I get to just normalize again and feel balance come back in. Mm. And then, you know, the days of fasting and of like this extreme, like, oh no, I'm not doing, you know, there was one year where I was really sick. I didn't touch chocolate, sugar, or any stimulants for a whole year mm. because I'd just given birth. I was breastfeeding and I was really needing to get my energy back. And that was really important, but I've tried to do that again and it's not working. <laughs> you know? It's like, and then I found, I have found this place that where I've, I'm experiencing what balance feels like. And I tell you, I've never had that in my life. Yes. Like, oh, this is balance. I can have a couple of pieces of chocolate yes. and not freak out yes. or eat a whole bar because I'm angry at myself. Right. Well, it's amazing. Well, you've, you've done the work to uncover and work with and look at the, the underlying causes and conditions, and then you're set free. You know, I'm thinking now about uh, there, there are many teachers that have had this phenomenon that you're describing of, I, the way I would describe it is, um, and this is part of the reason I wrote my book, basically to out myself to the entire world. <laughs> There's nothing you can't know. You know it, it, if there was any question, then I'm a fuck up, you know. <laughs> it's gone now. I love you. Yeah. I'm safe, you know. But it's it's that that um, that ego that ego piece for me of you know what happens if they find out? Mm. What happens if they really find out that this morning I woke up in anxiety? Mm. This morning I woke up with negativity or that I struggle in areas of my life where people would not necessarily think that a, 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 a yoga teacher a struggles in these. Like we have to get past this ourselves, but also our, our people who we share with, they have to get past these ideas as well. So, That's true. Um, uh, <clears throat> so one thing you said was you referenced being out of integrity with yourself um, as being uh, a cause for self-harming behavior. Yeah. And I think that's very important. And, and, and I want to bring up the idea of relapse here. The idea of picking up a behavior that you had previously put down and spent a fair amount of time realizing you had to put it down and then a fair amount of time without it in your life and having had great success. Yes. Things got a lot better. And yet we still see people in many, many cases. So what we still see are people relapsing, going back to a behavior that they have demonstrated to themselves is detrimental, if not life threatening. And yet, we go back and I find that all human beings take a couple steps forward and a step back, a couple steps. If you're, if you're, if you're on a good path, you take a couple steps forward and only one step back. Um, any thoughts from you about this idea of relapse? You, I, you just so hit it on the head, Tommy. And it's exactly how I feel about, you know, my episodes that I go in and out of. It's almost like a relapse. Um, um, and, and like I said, I think that it's connected, again, just to the basic um, fundamental of self-love, accepting where we fall short, yeah. accepting our own humanness, and, and, and really looking at this thing called shame. I mean, if I look at my brother, just to, to bring, because he's such an example. I mean, he spent a fair amount of time with you. Mm. In let's, recovery. Let's, let's name him. His name is Jerome. Mm. Let's yeah. bring Jerome in, in yeah. town. Yeah, because he really came with a big teaching, you know, for many of us. And he was in 12-step and, and sober for a year and then in and out. And, and really, when I look at what um, uh, drew him to that decision, it was massive amount of shame, mm. not only internally, but projected from the family. Mm. Uh, just a lack of self-love, a lack of community, a lack of being connected. When, when he was around me and he, he was around a little bit of community while he was in LA, he was, he was willing, he was, he, was, he was moving upward, you know, he was opening. Uh, and I think that 
what gets us into the relapse from my experience and witnessing him is when you lose connection, like so much of the basis of addiction is a craving for connection, mm. such a craving for like a hand or a hug or being able to speak our feelings, like experiencing again, our humanness, mm. you know, we cannot escape that. Yes, we are spiritual beings having a human experience and it's not easy mm. you know so the connection piece i think that if you are struggling with addiction um and it is part of of sort of like i, I will say kind of like your nature because i do feel it's part of my nature and i and i admit that to myself like yes i'm a being on the path of recovery and I'll, i won't call myself an addict that's my choice but i know that my nature, I've had my DNA read and the whole thing, it's to do this. I'm extreme and it's what makes me an artist as well. And it's what makes me a teacher, you know. But I know but because of that, I have to walk this line of balance. Mm -hmm. And I also know that if I go into like a relapse where I start eating a whole bar of chocolate a day, that to, to, to grab Aka's hand and to be like, I really need to talk right now. Like I'm about to go and buy a whole bar of chocolate and stuff it down. And I really don't want to because I don't want to feel like shit tomorrow and I don't want to disconnect from you. Because as soon as I do that, I disconnect from him and I disconnect from Sahesh. Mm -hmm. But if I can catch myself in that just that second before and speak on it and connect whether it's my coach, it's you or Kia or, or my close friends, it can shift. I can sort of like stop that, you know, relapse, which is a small relapse, a bar of chocolate, whatever. But it's big for me because it affects me. Yeah. You no. Know, so I really think the connection piece is, is so huge in addiction. Mm. So, so huge. Mm. Thank you so much. Uh, so, Sue Deb, I want to talk a little bit about your your focus on women's empowerment. Yes. And the workshops that you do uh, and your Shakti school. Um, do you find, obviously, coming from the lineage that you come from, this work must hold a very, very special place for you? Absolutely. You know, it's, it's really fueled by my lineage. Um, And it's what, it's my destiny. It's what I've come here to do. Um, and, and watching women in, in, in working with them and in retreats and stuff go from this like, wow, I'm so in my neurosis. And after seven days or working with private clients over six months or a year to watch them just being able to hone in their energy and start to harness their creative energy and really drive it towards their own destiny, their own creativity is the most satisfying thing for me. Because, you know, I wish that my mom had these tools. I wish that my grandmother had these tools. And I know that had I not had these tools, I was heading in the same direction as them. And so to share those tools with women and to witness them start to piece the puzzle back together of what it means to be whole and complete, you know, and we can be whole and complete and still fall short in all areas. I consider myself whole and complete and I'm forever <laughs> piecing myself back together because it's an integration that happens within with the soul and the identity. And once you start to experience that oneness, which is yoga, you know, it's like, yes, you'll come apart and you'll come back together, but you know how to come together. Mm -hmm. You know how to experience the oneness. So you do your work and you keep showing up. It doesn't mean because you went on a seven day retreat and you have this like existential experience that you're going to stay there. No, you're going to have to keep doing the work every 24 hours to experience that joining. So my work with women is to help them to cultivate their personal power from, from their navel, from that true place and really acknowledge and, and live into the fact that they are whole and complete and they are what I call medicine women. 
because every woman is a medicine woman. Mm -hmm. And intuitively, when she's connected to her intuition, she can heal, uplift anybody that comes into her space, mm -hmm. starting with herself. So I do that through Shakti School and through, uh, I just launched a, a new retreat called A Voyage into Sacred Sound, which is really a deep dive into mantra, which is my love, as you know, with music and Ikana, and really how to use mantra to conquer negativity, to grow in our prosperity, to live into our destiny, and to, to, to really learn these ancient tools that were given to us for these times and to deal with the madness of these times. Mm. Amazing. So that's a little bit about the work that I do. And yeah, it's all fueled, you know, by that divine feminine energy, which is my ancestors, which I feel present with me at all times, you know, and also having a six-year-old daughter and really wanting to give this new generation um, a path to walk into powerfully and know their own sacredness their own power and, and, and share their life and their destiny from that place. Yes. Yes. Well, Sue, Deb, my goodness, I, you know, you're my sister and I just love you so much. I'm so grateful. Uh, I'm so grateful for you and your family in our lives. And thank you for your teaching and your, 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 your presence. It's so important for so many. And, uh, I wanted to ask, can we, can we share, um, can we come up with a little Icona gift for people in the conference who are watching this? Absolutely. We'll share some music with them. Absolutely. We would love to do that. It's a yeah. nice thing to do. I'm sure they'll, we'll, we'll turn the whole, the whole community on. <laughs> yes, we'd love to. Maybe I'll, we'll put you and I will put together a playlist of like our favorite songs. Right? Amazing. Amazing. I'll send them the playlist. That's going to be a long list for me. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I'll do it like an album, you know. Yes. <laughs> That'll be really fun. Well, Sukhdev, how can folks find you and get in touch with you? Thank you. Yes, uh, Sukhdev Jackson, S-U-K-H-D-E-V, jackson.com. Or you can just simply type in shaktischool.com and that will take you there too. And we're also at ikana.com and that's A-Y-K-A-N-N-A.com. Mm -hmm. And of course, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, all the fun stuff we love to get into these days. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I love you so much. Great to see you. And uh, I'll see you really soon. <laughs> really soon. Hug really soon. Love you. Thank you. Thank you.